go live and it's actually really nice uh, live page now on YouTube very cool it's got the chat here and everything gonna share this a couple of places and then um, get started go on to Twitter Hi everybody, thanks for joining me. We'll get started here in just a couple of minutes. Hopefully everything's coming through. I'm going to just share this a few more places and then we'll get going. Cool, cool. Are we good? I think we're good. Okay, so we're gonna be illustrating a zombie today. So this is these are gonna be for a playing card game. Um well a card game. They're actually three by five cards. That's what I've set them up to be as of right now anyway. And I'm working out all of the illustrations little by little. That's a lot of work that's going into these cards. There'll probably, probably be over 200 illustrations by the time I'm done. There are nine um, player characters or heroes, nine class types, and um, I'm really not even sure how many monsters there's, there's going to be. A lot. And I did not set up the slimes yet so all right let's let's get into this so what i've been doing is i've been using paint.net and i've started the stream a little bit late in the process on this one i've already worked out the the line art and the flat colors and i'm just going to hide everything and show you the original sketch which is here and i'll just increase the opacity and you can see this is what I started with. Um, I actually did this in my notebook, which was lined paper. And you can see that I I went right off the edge where his feet his feet got cut off there. So in paint.net, I just imported this uh, rough sketch, sized it up to uh, my document size at 350 DPI. And then uh, with just like a blue brush, um, penciled in some feet so that he wouldn't be cut off there on top of that I, I then did my digital ink which really really cleans it up and this is what that ended up looking like and then of course um, I've just done my flat colors I'm gonna go ahead and delete my sketch layer because we don't need that anymore and then start creating my shadows and highlights. I'm going to go ahead and go to my white layer and just select everything. 
and then go above my color layer, create a new layer. Double click, I'm going to call this shadows. And we'll put the blending mode on multiply, 120 for the opacity, click OK. That's my shadow layers uh, layer set up. And then what I do is I, I choose a very dark purple. And I use a purple on the multiply blending mode for all of my shadows. And I, most of my illustrations, if not all of them, the light source is sort of coming just from the top down. Um, and then, you know, I sort of try to take into consideration any other light source that might be um, on or around the subject. So, for example, the Warlock and the Wizard both had, like, spells that they were getting ready to blast. Um, sort of charging in their hands or on their staff and uh, so anywhere there would be light coming from I'll take that into consideration during this process and decide where those shadows should be falling otherwise sort of my just general rule of thumb is the bottom of surfaces or planes um, will get shadow and if there's anything overlapping anything else it will cast a shadow So actually what I'm doing here is the same process that I do when I fill in large areas of black with the line art, as well as what I do for most of the coloring. So it's essentially just sort of rinse and repeat. Um, I have a an 8 pixel round brush, no shape dynamics, no uh, pressure sensitivity. I don't believe paint.net right now supports that anyways and I don't need it for what I'm doing here it actually would not it would not be helpful for me uh, I really like the kind of mono line illustration much like sort of my ballpoint pen or sharpie drawings um, when I do my line art that's just kind of what I've used in the past. So when I'm doing traditional, um, maybe like line art and watercolor on paper, very, very similar to sort of, you know, like how I design or used to design, <laughs> I st still do, but my tools have changed, um, tattoos. And tattoos have to be very, I mean, they can actually be pretty detailed, but um, you don't want to you don't want to get lines too close to each other. There's just like certain things when you're going on skin on anything that's going to sort of lose definition over time. The, the simpler and cleaner the better. And so well, you can use tapered lines, of course, and you could do that in, in, in any illustration. Um, I just don't bother with it. I, I used to kind of be obsessed with that, and, and, I've, and I've sort of shifted gears over the last couple of years uh, of drawing, and, you know, I used to think that I, I needed, like, you know, really high-end like Prismacolor and... and Copic and Windsor Newton and whatever else. Um, and well, I definitely enjoy using all kinds of art supplies and products and tools and everything. Um, it was 
it's also kind of become a, a mission, a goal of mine to to do things that help me produce more, that actually help me help me get my stuff done, and uh, and not just constantly be sort of product testing, right? And 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 that might just be me, but. Um, I would kind of find myself a lot actually product testing just you know I'm, I'm experimenting with something new uh, you know I want to try out these new brushes or you know whatever and if something wasn't working the way that I wanted it to or the way that I expected it to or I was hoping for Um, I would just kind of get frustrated and I'd have a lot of art that never got finished. So one year I challenged myself to uh, just fill a sketchbook with only Sharpie and markers or watercolors, uh, essentially colored colored ink, colored ink, or watercolors. The idea is was for me to to just you know not focus so much on perfection or. Um, actually don't like that shadow there uh, or even necessarily quality as I was saying but but actually focus on quantity now that might sound backwards that might sound bizarre that might sound I don't know how that sounds however it sounds you know actually to me I thought that was the wrong thing to do which is why I'd, I really hadn't practiced like that before you know, I thought, no, I have to make sure that my line work is perfect before I could ever, you know, put down color. I got to make sure that you know, use nice paper and just every little thing, you know, sort of obsessed with the with the uh, final product before ever getting anything on the paper to just have anything. And so I, I kind of wanted to train myself out of that and, and to stop being afraid of, of using paper, of using tools, of making mistakes. Um, and being okay with the idea of, you know, getting something out on paper start to finish, just finish it. And then if I didn't like how it turned out, at least it was something that was finished. And I can always go back and, you know, do another one. And the second time I do it, it's going to be much more, uh, it's actually going to be faster and it's going to be more refined. Just it's, it was, it's kind of given it's going to end up better the second time. And I saw that happening a lot. And so, you know, just training myself to finish. Uh, a picture, a piece of art. Actually ended up making me a lot better of an artist. Um, and, and also honestly a lot faster as well because my whole goal was was to was to produce to put out finished work and you know, I sort of began seeing some of the tendencies that I that I had some of the mistakes that I would make 
and figured out what I was doing because I could go back then and look at this library of, of things that I had been making, mistakes and all. And especially when you're using, you know, Sharpie and watercolors, you can't, you can't, you can't, uh, th th those are both very unforgiving mediums. And of course I would pencil it in first and, and whatever, but you, you know, I just not been used to like doing like at a page a day minimum. And most of them were tattoo designs. Uh, so most of them were Sharpie and water-based ink or watercolor. Bold, thick um, outlines. Single weight strokes for the most part. And very uh, simple and, and, and bold concepts. Simple subjects. And it helped me develop a style. It helped me develop a process, whether I'm drawing traditionally on, on you know, analog, you know, on paper with analog tools or digitally. And, you know, now I've sort of brought that process to what I'm doing here. So, well, uh, well, doing things digitally, I think, is it's not cheating. It's it's a different medium. It's a different tool. And what I liked about the Sharpie and watercolor or Sharpie and marker illustrations is the, the just sort of very yes or no about the lines uh, that the that those illustrations were um, you know you essentially have shapes cl closed in shapes with the solid black lines that define either different materials or different objects and then filled in mostly with just flat color with watercolor you, you know I, I could do some, gr some gradients and stuff but mostly it was just flat color And that whole process, that whole year of practice is sort of now paid off one in a, in a, in a process for myself, a homemade illustration process that helps me create consistent looking artwork, consistent as in, in the sense that it, it doesn't look like every single one is a, is a practice or an exploration into some kind of new style it starts to look like my style that has just taken a long time to do and even to like to even be able to 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 know or to measure whether something looks like it's my style or not takes a long time and a lot of uh, it takes a lot of art it takes a lot of trial and error and practice and by doing this you know sort of self self discipline challenge uh, and and uh, focusing on producing finished pieces for me actually helped me increase my quality significantly because because honestly I, I just wouldn't draw before you know I would draw for a little while and end up with another piece I didn't finish end up with another you know half drawn character in my sketchbook or notebook and have nothing finished so I kept up this this practice so I keep these notebooks and for me even just lined paper that's that's where this illustration came from just one of my dollar store 
notebooks, drew it out, and I didn't even use Sharpie for that. I just, a lot of my, my notebooks I'll just do, I'll keep them black and white so that I can um, easily see the lines when I either photo uh, scan them or uh, take pictures with my phone. Which is what I did to get this into the computer. I just used the Google uh, Photo Scan app. Automatically backs up to my Google Photos account. I can open up my browser when I get to the computer. Copy, and, copy it to my clipboard and paste it right into paint.net. So the other thing I, I like about this you know, being able to create a process for myself is that I know this will work in any uh, photo editing software. This will work in Photoshop. It will work in Krita. It'll work, obviously, in Paint.net. It'll work in uh, Paint Tool Sci. It will work in Manga Studio. And I can achieve I can achieve exactly the same results. Paint.net is free and open source. That was another challenge for myself is to create not just a, a process, but to limit myself in the tools that I was going to use for this entire project. Um, I wanted to support open source developers. So if you, if you use paint.net, you can download it for free, getpaint.net. Um, and for Mac and for Linux, it's a very, very similar open source application. Essentially, it's the same thing called Pinta. Uh, and I would just suggest making a donation. It can be as little as a dollar to help them continue developing, creating plugins, uh, new versions, new tools, new features, um, better stability, faster speed, and always continue providing this piece of software, offering this piece of software for free and allowing other people in the community to build on it, to, to, you know, take the code and make it even big, bigger and better or invent something new based on it. I just, I like supporting projects like that. I like supporting creatives, uh, creating software for artists like myself has got to be a huge task and they've done a great job creating something that is incredibly lightweight and yet extremely powerful. Anything really that gives me layers. I remember when Photoshop didn't have layers. And it was almost like, what am I supposed to do with this? That was a long time ago. So you have full layer control in paint.net over opacity, over blending mode, um, hierarchy of layers. So you can put things on top of uh, other things. And I'm just gonna make the bottom part of these of his fingers here actually all in shadow, just like that. I like that better. So you can see how I can kind of scribble in some of the shading and then other times I will outline 
selections and then switch quickly to the fill bucket tool and just flood fill it in. So the zombie is actually similar as far as just the uh, function of the cards in this game called Rignar. In that, uh, similar to the slime, in that uh, when you take damage from this creature, It has a lasting effect on your character. For the slime, if you take even just one damage from a slime, you are poisoned until you can do something to remove the condition, which would either be an antidote or a cleric being able to cast cure on you. And really, those are the only two ways to get rid of it. And what it will do is take one hit point per turn until you are cured. And I don't mean around, I mean per turn. So if you're not cured at the end of your turn, you'll lose a hit point. If you're not cured at the end of your uh, out next ally's turn, you lose another hit point. And it will go like that until you're cured. The zombie is much tougher though because they have a lot of hit points. They're essentially a sack of hit points. They have 13 hit points and they cause disease if they deal any damage. So think about The Walking Dead. Think about you know any zombie movie that you might have seen. They don't just attack if they wound you uh, in a way that would cause infection in the blood or something like that which really could just be about even just a scratch and that's the idea is you take one hit point of damage from a zombie you're diseased and you will be fighting that disease, taking damage until you can be cured of the disease. I think I made that point.
Hey Tango, how you doing? Thanks for watching. Alright, so that, I believe it will be all of the shading. You see how that purple just has a cool effect on, on the shadow. It's not just darker versions of the colors. It has a... A tone, and I don't mean... I'm, I'm, I mean both in, um, like, light and dark. I'm just erasing little bits of this right now. So you can kind of see those scratches there. Uh, I mean the tone is in light and dark, but also mean is in mood. Alright, so... I'll create a new layer. Double click on this, call this one highlights. And we'll change our blending mode to screen. And our opacity to 120. Click OK. So now we're going to do the highlights the same way I just did the the shading or the shadows. I'm going to go in now and this is going to mainly apply to the top ridges of planes and shapes and objects. And again, this is just a light yellow. I'm not using white. And here's the difference. Here's why. So here's, um, this is a light yellow on a semi-transparent layer on the blending mode of screen. This is if I was painting with white. See the, di the, the difference in color? And I want my highlights to be most of the time. I'm not going to say all the time because lighting will affect how colors are perceived. Uh, in fact, it that's that is how we perceive colors in the in the first place is light. So the light really will dictate a lot of what we perceive. But in general, I want my highlights to be warmer and my shadows to be cooler. So a light yellow rather than just a lighter version of the solid colors, adding some yellow uh, in screen mode, which will affect the colors differently, just like the purple. Is a, is a really fast but effective way of sort of reinforcing the dimension, the depth, the temperature, the mood, uh, and the, the contours, the, the, the forms of the illustration. And um, also remember this is this is for a, a plain card. And so while it might not look like there's much detail in here, you know, I don't need a lot of gradual changes. I don't need a lot of you know real subtle 
color variation. What I need is clear shapes. Um, easy to understand forms. And high contrast in both uh, shape and in color. So this can read clearly. It does get a little bit cartoony, which is actually also part of part of my style. I don't, I don't really care about photorealism. Um, I'm interested in in story and personality and emotion, um, in ideas and concepts. If I want something to look real, really, really real. Get a camera. My art is to help communicate concepts, to be fun, uh, to inspire, and to illustrate characters, ideas, stories, all of the above. I do think that, that practicing, um, like I was saying about quantity, also practicing drawing from your, from your, your memory, from your visual memory, rather than always looking at a reference. Now I find references very, very helpful, definitely useful, but what I would recommend is kind of going back and forth from, you know, draw from a reference and then see if you can draw it from your memory. And the better your visual memory becomes, um, I think the better you can communicate um, the the um, the illusion or the implication of of an idea or of a story or of a character because it's it's just that much more believable but it's not um, It's not my goal at least not, not right now you know to create uh, reproductions of photographs or or something like Rembrandt or da Vinci So what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm going back and erasing a little bit of the shadow from these areas that, want to, that I wanted to be blood. And I'm just kind of giving a little bit of a, a highlight and then getting rid of some of the shadow so that you can see some of the base color coming through there. to hopefully look kind of wet and blood-like. And zoom back out, go back to the highlight layer. Got a bit more highlights to do as we keep going down here. I'm not gonna add much to the blade and we're gonna keep that pretty simple. Um, I may do sort of some bounce light. So 
just underneath here. So you can really see the edge of this blade. That ought to do it. few highlights on the the knee of the pants here just on some of the edges and I'm focusing now just touching some of these edges just to give the the implication the illusion. Of uh, the light that's wrapping around. So I'm being a little bit more conservative with the the highlights a little bit more restrained and just focusing really on those very top ridges of light. zoom out and you can really start seeing how just like three shades essentially three sh three shades I've got a base color a shadow and a highlight and those thick ink lines on top uh, can really effectively communicate the concepts in this case a zombie leather wrapping boots uh, you know a sword with some blood on it some some tattered clothing you start to get the idea very quickly and it stops looking like lines and blobs of color and like just something that your brain can interpret And I find that a fascinating and, and fun process. A little bit of rim light.
All right, I think that's done. I might do one more layer on top of my ink layer. I'm going to call this glow. I've been doing this more and more and I just like the effect that I get. So I create a new layer, I put it on color dodge, bring the opacity down to about 150. And then with my light yellow, I go to a very, very large brush. I take my hardness all the way down, turn my anti-aliasing back on. So I have this very, very soft airbrush now. And yeah, let's just size up my brush. Maybe maybe around 400 and You'll see as I start to paint on things it glows on top of the line art and so You get this really kind of cool effect when it with that color dodge blending mode So I like to kind of I put it on some of the metal Anywhere where I, I want kind of a shine and um, put it in these eyes. All of a sudden these eyes pop out. And to me, this little bit of coloring, very little, of coloring in the, uh, the line art, I'm also affecting the you know, all of the colors that we did, the shading, the highlights. And just, just adding a little bit of color. And this yellow, as you can see, it makes the black kind of red. And just a few spots here and there. So that's with that's with the glow. That's without. Okay. I'm also just gonna go to my color layer. I'm gonna reset my brush. 8 pixels, hardness all the way up, turn my anti-aliasing back off. And... Here and there, just put in a bright hot spot of white. I think mainly just in the eyes. Maybe on the, the metal here. On the tongue, I can make that look even more wet and slimy. Okay, I think that's it. So I'm going to save this. And then I'm going to save out a PNG. There it is. I just like to look through it here. Looks, looks good. Okay. It's going to flatten that down to a PNG. And let's go ahead and finish the card. So uh, in Google Slides, this is where I'm doing all the layout and design work. So 
I'm gonna go find my PNG image of the zombie. I can drag and drop it right in, and you can see this is this is huge. We're gonna have to size it down. Just scale it down with uh, grabbing one corner, holding shift as I do it to make sure I maintain the proportions. And we'll zoom in here and get it lined up. I had copied the um, my skeleton card so that I can have a base to start with and then just change out my artwork. So I'm going to ungroup this card. I'll delete the skeleton. I'll move in the zombie. Get them lined up where I want them, and then I'll crop it to the edges of the card. Just wanted to compare it to some of the other ones. I like it. So then we just rename the card Zombie. And I'm going to grab one of my other cards. I'm going to grab the slime card. We're going to pull that up so that I can get the copy or the text um, similar to the wording on that one. Maybe I did not set up the uh, slimes yet. Okay, well, we know it's undead, and then it's going to have a an effect, so... This is going to be deal one heart of damage. Every turn until Until his condition is removed. And this is going to be Now he spelled this disease disease. Just want to double check. D I S E A S E. Worth checking. All right. So that's the new card, but of course, 
zombies are fleshy and tough and have lots of hit points. They have no uh, bonuses um, for armor or or for their attack. Uh, so they're just they're they're just nasty because if you take any damage from them. So if you roll poorly, you will be diseased. And yeah, one treasure. These are tougher. Let's make that two. We'll try it out. So this is what I've been doing. So we went from paint.net, finished our illustration in there. Then all, all of our layers in here, saved it out as a PNG. High resolution PNG. Brought it into our Google Slides document where I have the sort of template cards set up here and created our new card for the zombie monster in this game and this process is really working out really well um i think this will be a really good looking card on the table um i think it'll be really easy to, to see that that's a zombie you know that's a goblin that's a skeleton i think that these uh are are going to be really obvious that's a wolf i also have another wolf which I think is actually even better. It's 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 more clear to see that's a wolf. A bear. Back to our zombie. What else do we have? Uh, recently finished the leather armor. Recently finished the potion. Yesterday finished the elixir. Refreshes one spell during combat. These are conditions, so I'm going to capitalize poison and bold it, and disease and bold it. Removes poison and disease conditions. That's the antidote. Plate armor. And then I have several backs for these cards. So we've got the character cards, the adventure cards, which will be both monsters and traps and other things. And tre treasure cards, which will be like your equipment, your items, your potions. And then of course the character cards. So the warlock, I'm really liking the warlock. I think he's gonna be a great character. I'm also really liking the wizard. I think that he will be challenging to play, but I think that the the reward will be a lot of fun. Wizards just do massive amounts of damage. Once you get them uh, learning spells, All right, that's it for now, guys. Thank you for watching. The behind the scenes process, illustrating this card game, bringing it to life. A lot of work is going into this. Here's our zombie card. Finished tonight. And um, stay tuned for more to come. Bye for now.